What's up, Utu Trust Guardians? I'm Mike, your Chief Commercial Officer, and welcome to another episode of Utu Trust Guardian Interviews. This is where we chat with team members, investors, advisors, and general supporters of Utu to learn more about their backgrounds, why they believe in Utu, and how they're helping to increase trust across the entire internet. Today, I am super excited to chat with the newest member of the Utu Board of Directors, David Holtzman. What's up, David? How you doing? David is a world-renowned cybersecurity and privacy expert who designed the global DNS registration system used by ICANN, kind of a big deal. Uh, he's held senior executive positions at IBM and Network Solutions and much more, uh, which David will talk all about. David, welcome to the Utu board. Welcome to the interview. How are things going? Things are going pretty well, Mike. I. Um... You know, it's kind of hard to talk to anybody about anything without thinking about the pandemic. And it's, yeah. it's not over. And I know this is just an American viewpoint because I've just recently been out of the country, but it's just nice seeing anything getting better anywhere. And it's just, I feel more optimistic. So. Yeah, we are, we are getting there. But like you said, it's kind of like cautious optimism. Things can still change. We're still seeing variants out there, but definitely feel that things are on the upswing. We're getting back into a little bit more into, into normal life. And it's sunny here in Washington, D.C. We yes. still don't. We have no, it's the best of both worlds. We have good weather and no tourists. So it's, it's, it's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, tourist season uh, is, is big, but yeah, yes. So we are both in Washington, D.C. And uh, even though we're still doing this uh, over over Zoom, um, hopefully we can meet in person for uh, for a coffee or a drink uh, soon. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been a couple of weeks since you've been on our board um, and you've already been uh, super involved and responsive. So we appreciate that and definitely want to get into uh, how you see uh, helping Utu and uh, helping us achieve our vision. But let's uh, let's kick it off with talking a little bit more about your background on both uh, personal and professional level. Okay, um, it's it's a little eclectic. So the, I've been trying to think what the unifying theme is, and I think it's about it's about information. So um, w when I graduated college, I had a degree in philosophy. I taught philosophy. I studied symbolic logic and ethics, two things that are actually still useful, especially today in America. Um, I, when I, I get married young, I had a kid, I went into the Navy and because of my test scores, they made me an intelligence agent. So I spent a couple of years at a, a, a language school learning Russian and then cryptography schools and spy schools. And then they stuck me on submarines. So I was a cryptographer before even anybody even knew what cryptography was. And uh, it was really fascinating. And then I spent a couple of years at NSA uh, working for a group that um, uh, basically I was an expert on the Soviet manned space program, the uh, Mir and the Soviet seven space stations. So while I was doing that, um, I got into computers a lot and I wrote, ended up writing my own programs because you couldn't buy or even you at NSA they didn't have that, that many commercial like PC kind of kind of programs. So I picked up some more degrees in computer science, minor in math, went to Hopkins for grad school. And uh, I got into the early internet um, in the, I guess this would be the mid eighties and held a couple of jobs around the area, uh, working for around here, what we call Beltway Bandits, which are defense contractors, as you probably know. Of course, yeah. um, and I ended up with some, I, I ran research for Booz Allen and Hamilton for a number of years. And I became an expert on what was called the next computer system. Uh, I got to know Steve Jobs, that was his yeah. company. And I knew all uh, the guys at Pixar because there were like six of them at the time. And he was Steve Jobs on them too. And I could um, maybe over a, uh, during some time, I'll tell you some like bizarre Steve Jobs stories. And they're not at, not at all for public consumption. But um, <laughs> he was a really cool guy. And, and I totally drank the Kool-Aid. Object-oriented programming, the internet, the whole thing. Yeah. And because the micro, Microsoft refused to accept the internet, the Windows systems didn't even have TCP IP, the underlying protocol. Steve was totally all into it. And um, I really got into it. And I, I went to IBM and I became the chief scientists in their internet information group. 
So I built their digital rights management system. Again, photography based. Mm -hmm. um, we were trying to figure out how to sell digital content. My, uh, I ran the business development group too, and my, con my clients were Playboy Magazine and Marvel Comics, um, cool. which was really cool. So I got to do like Wolverine trading cards that were digital. So really what these were, were NFTs. It's just nobody had that. <laughs> yeah. We didn't, and we were trying to do that with Playboy Centerfolds, if anybody even remembers what a Playboy Centerfold was. But we tried <laughs> to do that at the time. So we were very forward thinking which is generally a bad idea at IBM. So I started looking around for other jobs. I had a ton of job offers and I took a job working for a company called Network Solutions in Hearns of Virginia. Network Solutions um, was a small 8A firm that was running off a, a cooperative agreement with the National Science Foundation. And they, uh, they basically ran the internet. So they ran all the domain names, all the North American TCP IP network addresses, uh, all this, this, the CDPD, all the cellular data. So it was all the, all the, it wasn't the wires and it wasn't the machines, but it was everything right above that layer. And we did it, um, we did it under a government contract. The internet started getting really big and because of Mosaic being, being developed and all of a sudden you had browsers and then you had stuff to look at. And the company got huge, too fast. Uh, we did an IPO, a couple of secondaries. Um, the company um, made a lot of money, but we were under attack for uh, antitrust in the Clinton administration, and we ended up divesting most of what we had and creating ICANN, and in return, we were allowed to basically cash out our stock. So that worked out. It worked out for me personally, but it, it was it was okay. Um, I have mixed opinions about ICANN, which is probably for another talk. But um, but what, what I got to see out of all that was I got to see. The, when I got there in 96, there were like uh, 75,000, 100,000 domain names. When I left in four years, there were 10 million. And each domain name, it's not just a name. I mean, some of them are, but a lot of them, it's a, it's a website. So these were just websites just coming on and on and on. The whole dot-com bubbles happening. You know, I had one of the founders of, of, of Napster working for me as a consultant because he lived in Oakland, Virginia at the time. It was just crazy. And, um, and I got really worried about privacy and not, not like a, either you have it or don't have a binary thing. But, uh, for me, I, I was very thoughtful about, about it. It took me years to realize it wasn't privacy, it was identity, which, and that's what plays, I think, a lot into the YouTube message. Um, I wrote a book called Privacy Lost, which uh, is still in print and it's in almost every law school in the country. They, they read it and it's about the legal and the philosophical implications behind digital privacy. I wrote another book on identity theft. I ran a presidential campaign up run. I was a CPO for Senator Evan Biden's presidential campaign, and I was uh, the cybersecurity expert for um, General Wesley Clark's campaign. Um, wrote a couple other books. I got kind of disgusted uh, with the fact that nobody seemed to care about privacy or security, and I started traveling, and you know, I'll probably talk about that later, but I traveled a lot. I went all over the world. And, I, and what I was curious about was how people use technology and how it changed their lives. About five, six years ago, I started getting into blockchain companies, helping them out, director, advisor, consultant, mostly Germany, Germany and Iceland and Liechtenstein, because um, everybody's afraid to do stuff in America because they're afraid the, the SEC is going to shut down like the ICOs for the tokens and stuff. Right. Like you could, you couldn't have done YouTube in the United States, just as an example. Yeah, definitely not. Yeah. So, um, at this point in my life, I'm writing novels. Um, I'm working with boards of companies that I believe in, and um, I guess that's my background. Yeah, that is <laughs> that is some background. Uh, I mean, we can dig into uh, so many things there. Um, you know, I, and I definitely want to hear those Steve Jobs stories uh, yeah. sometime, sometime offline. Um, but yeah, like, you know, it, it's just so interesting how you were, you know, just in the center of it all when the internet was coming up. Like you said, you saw you saw the growth of these uh, uh, domain, domain names to, uh, you know, up to, to from a small number up to like tens of millions. Um, do you kind of see uh, we'll talk a little bit about your, uh, get more into your transition in crypto, but like, do you kind of see that's where we are in crypto right now? Is that like, um, 
there's a there's a bit of like a calm before the storm and that you're going to see that that massive growth where do you see us in crypto right now in terms of that timeline so when you say us we mean like us not in, in general the whole industry yeah um so so there was a, an article that i have clipped out around here it was in the new york times 1901 and they said the job for the next century will be the cto or ceo but they meant chief electrical officer okay so they, they had all these studies indicating that the best job for anybody was to be the chief electrical officer because of, of a correct and an incorrect assumption. The correct assumption was that everybody would be, need electricity. The incorrect assumption was that you would need a, a PhD to be able to basically plug in a lamp because they didn't, they didn't think about outlets. So they didn't think, you know, you have to call five guys into wire lamp and then you'd have to blow a light bulb and all this kind of shit. And, and what you really needed to do was develop uh, an, an API, an SDK, which is what an electrical outlet is. So once you do that, then things become interoperable and they, uh, they become widely accepted. And then people that, you know, they're not necessarily dumb, but people that are just users can use it. So cryptography is right at that point right now. And that's why I'm, I'm bringing up that example. So like email, nobody encrypts their email. I don't even do it. Everybody should do it. I mean, it's just common sense that you should do it. If somebody said in a vacuum, if it doesn't cost you anything, would you encrypt your email? Anybody not understands it would go, yeah, of course I would. But nobody does because it's too hard. It's too difficult. There's been a thing out for 30 years called PGP, pretty good privacy. And you can use, you can use it today. You can encrypt your email. But you have to get a big cryptographic string. It's well, it's like it's like cryptocurrencies. Have you ever tried to buy or sell ether? It's it's not it's not as easy as it looks like it all be, right? And and then you're terrified because you've got like twenty thousand bucks of Bitcoin or just like half a Bitcoin right now or something. <laughs> and if you and you just know that if you like type an A instead of a B and you don't catch it, you just like gave some guy in in Okinawa your money. And it's um so. It, it, that level of terror keeps people from using cryptography unless it's built into something like an iPhone so you don't actually notice it. You don't have to work at it. So I believe that that's where we're at with cryptography. Cryptography is right at that level where it's about to become universally usable the same way plugging in a lamp is usable or other technologies that hit the mainstream. And typically it takes about 50 years or technology to get to that point. And I think we're now at that point. And I'll talk some other things I think you're gonna ask me about what I think that means, but that's one of the reasons Utu is so well positioned because so many of the things that Utu as a company is advocating and building, I think play right into this expansion growth. Yeah, so let's um, let's let's segue into that. Thank you for, for that perfect transition. So um, yeah, how did you first discover Utu? Um, and what made you de, you know, decide to join our board? So, you know, kind of building upon what you, you talked about, how, uh, um, how those, those factors are, are all combining to, uh, to get us where we are today in, uh, in crypto. Um, and how does that roll into what we're doing at U2? Um, I have a friend named Keith Hansen, who uh, you may have met when he lives in DC. He's doing some legal work for Jason, the CEO of the company Ubuntu, mm -hmm. and he had been telling me about this young guy that he had mentored and suggested I meet him someday. And then one day he said, Hey, I want you to meet Jason. So, of course, it's the middle of the pandemic. So, you know, that means like a Zoom call. So, um, I talked to Jason and I was fascinated with what he was doing because I've tried to do something like this a couple of times. Okay. Um, yeah, oh yeah, I built, I built, I've had two. One was a very well-funded startup to do something very similar, and it, it they they failed. And I know other companies that I've been involved with, or, or even just watch, and they've also tried to do this and they failed. So I believe the reason for that is I think that, I think this goes back to my earlier point about adoption curves. I don't think people were ready for this stuff. Mm -hmm. I think they're ready for it now. So it, the crypto stuff is just like electricity. That's just how you power it. But what, what's important is the social change, um, the buying habits, consumer habits, the things that fall out of that as an outcome. Uh, and that's when you need things like reputation, um, uh, you know, privacy, trust, 
all of that stuff. That's what's really important. And I think Utu has an approach that seems like a very reasonable one to me that can empower that. If, you know, the real problem is getting lots of people to use it. And that's always the problem with this kind of a, a business. And it's how well you market, how well you sell yourself, how good your technology is. That's, um, that remains to be seen. But, but from what I met at, you know, with Jason, Bastian, some of the board members meeting you today, I mean, some really good people involved with the company. And I think, I think the timing is really good. So that's why I was interested. I've had a, a very, a, a multi-decade interest in this kind of technology. And I, I mean, I can tell you why. I mean, it's like, you know, when you, um, when you go to do something on the internet, it, it's very, very difficult. It's easy to find many, many wrong answers to every single question. It is very difficult to navigate that on almost any subject imaginable. It used to be kind of easy. So like, you know, restaurants are still kind of okay. You know, there's, there's places, you know, newspapers, you know, the Zagats and stuff. You can look up a restaurant. Hotels, not, not a chance. I mean, uh, TripAdvisor is, is so deep in everybody's pockets. I don't believe a single word I read on TripAdvisor. I do not, I do not read, I do not believe anything I read on Yelp. I don't even know why Yahoo still exists as a company, but I wouldn't use them. Um, and so there is no way to actually do that. And now we've got the gig economy, which is huge. Yeah. Without getting into the U.S. political problems going on right now in our economy, it seems to me that an awful lot of people are going to be sending their kids to college for money they make out of the gig economy. And and the and the underlying driver for gig gig stuff is is trust. I mean, and, you know, Utu's got, you know, the, the one piece of their business with the taxi driver stuff in Nairobi. And, and that's just a small example of a much larger global problem. I travel a lot. And when you, when you go to another, even another city, I mean, I know my neighborhood. I know which restaurants suck. I know if I had to stay in a hotel, I know which ones I would stay in. But if I go to a city, I don't know. I have no clue. How do I, how do I hire a cab driver? You know, this is why... This is the only reason Uber even exists because Uber, like, I mean, Uber is basically, you know, the modern equivalent of a cotton plantation in the 17th century. I mean, the, the workers are unhappy. They don't like it, but people use it because it's the only way to actually get a, a, a cab ride in less than 30 minutes anyway. Yeah. Um, and, and all of that's based on trust. So yeah. Uber has this um, undeserved veneer of trust and reputation because people think there is a less likely chance you're gonna get raped and murdered in an Uber car than you are in some random car. So it's safer, so you go with Uber because you trust them. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that just tells you what's happening. But now apply that to picking a doctor, picking you know someone who can come in and, and babysit your kids, yep. walk your dog. I mean, this is, all of this is based on trust. Yeah. And trust, trust is not a quantifiable, AI driven number. Trust is based on human beings and it's a web. So like, I'm sure you're like this, I am like, like when I, when I listen to new music, it's not because, well, sometimes it's because Spotify says actually, to be fair, Spotify is actually pretty good. But, okay. but most of the times it's because somebody I know says, oh, I know you, Dave, um, listen to this group. You're going to really like them. And I mean, most of the time I will, and, and I'll, and because they're my friend, I'll believe. Yeah. So, but that's what this is. This, it's, this just, Utu is just going to be a way of, um, in, industrializing and institutionalizing the web of trust that has existed since the beginning of time anyway. Yeah. And, but to do it and not get spooked, you need cryptography. So that's the connection because if you don't have it and you have too much, uh, You've got like doxing and spamming and too many other things that fall into it. So yeah. cryptography, trust, reputation, those are the three pieces. Yeah. And uh, I think also just the kind of new economic model that blockchain provides that you now you can build those incentives that uh, that will um, you know, incentivize people to be more trustworthy and do have more trustworthy actions. Um, but you know what? One of, one of the things I just thought about, I don't know why it came to me, but um, you know, you were saying how you've you've been obsessed about this 
uh, this this problem over the last you know 20 plus years and you know just from the beginning of time you know you talk about this time horizon and just remember like uh, for some reason it came to my mind I have like you know when Jeff Bezos talked about like uh, there's so many there's so many companies that have formed it's like all right what's gonna change in 10 years and then build a company for that right and Jeff Bezos said uh, well no, no no I'm looking at it the other way what's not gonna change like well, right? and it's like oh people will always want an easy way to buy something at a low price, right? And I think similar to trust for the next 10, 20, forever, trust will be an important uh, aspect of the way people purchase goods, the way people make decisions, and the way that we trust, I believe, uh, in real life is not gonna change either. Like you said, you're gonna trust your friend, trust your friend's opinion, um, and where, where, or your family, where they stayed or, or uh, restaurants they went to, or, you know, the doctor they chose, uh, that's never going to change. So I think that's kind of where we're building for that future that, uh, we, uh, we understand that that's not going to change and we need to change the way that we think trust on the internet to match how we trust in real life, which will never change. So I think that's a really long vision that we're looking at here. It, this is absolutely a long vision, but I don't, it's not 20 years. It's less than 10. So uh, it, I don't know if you call that long or not, but it's, it's, it's in that, it's in the three to 10 year time. Frame. But there, there's a, there's another side of what you mentioned though, Mike, the, um, it's not just the, you know, the, the buying stuff thing. It's also the empowerment of an individual. So I was just traveling out of the country last week, the first time, and I was in a hotel. And something, you know, I got something bad happened. It wasn't really bad, but it, a dinner got really screwed up, like really, really badly. And I talked to the hotel manager and they offered me a free bottle of champagne if I didn't post it anywhere on social media. And yeah. that is not the first time that has happened to me. That's like sure. the eighth time that's happened to me. So it's not, they know the power of, of yeah. pissing somebody off. So if they think, I mean, if they think you're just a jerk, they're just gonna let you do what you want. But if, if you seem like a reasonable person that people might actually believe, it's worth it to them to make it, make it good with you. And, and that's, that's an empowerment that hasn't existed in this country or in this world for half a century. So it's, it's like when you deal with the really big companies, like imagine if you went to AT&T screwed you over in your cell phone bill, and you call AT&T, assuming you get through, and you get through, um, we have to have Verizon to get through to AT&T, but so you call and you get somebody on the phone and you say, I'm gonna write a bad Yelp review about AT&T unless you give me a bottle of champagne. Good luck on the bottle of champagne. Right. But, it, but if you go to a small business person, a, yeah. a hotel owner, a restaurant, owner, an Uber driver, I mean, these are people that really care and they really care what they get on social media. So social media has, I mean, you could, you could probably obliterate a business on TikTok if you really wanted to. And, and people have done that. On the converse side of that, I mean, I'm, the, one of the things that just fascinates me about pop culture, uh, and this is an incredible digression, is the Kardashian family. Because you've got this family of, you know, I don't even know how many people, six, seven, eight, whatever. But they, they have made billions of dollars kind of, you know, putting themselves out there, I think is a nice way of putting it on social media. And it all started with a sex tape anyway. And, and it's just, and, and what they've done is they were the, the first ones to realize how incredibly powerful an individual's profile and opinion actually is to sure. where, I mean, nobody, you know, nobody reads print ads and newspapers. Nobody watches TV. I mean, you know, you if, like makeup. I know, I know I don't have the statistics at my hand, but I've read it. Most makeup sales are driven by, by shout outs and product placements on, um, on Instagram. Yeah. Influencers and everything. Yeah. Oh, big time. And I'm sure you know this, but there's like all these, I was working with a company that was doing this. They have like, this company has this big house in, in Beverly Hills. And they invite influencers to come and stay for free in the hotel. And yep. there's a nice pool and they, there's lots of booze and yeah. you know, everybody's wearing swimsuits and stuff and they take a lot of their money away. And then the whole thing is photogenic. They have backdrops everywhere, you know, stuffed gorillas and 
hot air balloons, and right. things that look good on Instagram. And it's a business. Yeah. It so, is. but you know, this is this is all stuff that is it, it's not even oblique. It's tied into Utu because all this is like, who are you going to trust? Who are you going to believe? Yep. And and then when you see like an influencer that does something kind of racist or stupid, it hurts them. Yeah. Like yeah. Jake Paul. Jake Paul's a good example of that. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Yeah, and you don't know who's, you know, it's they're not always transparent about, you know, who's paying them to say what and everything like that. So you really got to understand how how trustworthy those those people are because they really do have a big impact on many many people's decisions. Well, also, and, and I will get a little political for a second, but it, we don't know what the truth is anymore. I mean, that's right. So when I was growing up, we had newscasters like Walter Cronkite or you know Dan Rather or somebody, and we all kind of believe what they said. Yep. If they said, you know, Richard Nixon's a crook, we all said, okay, Richard Nixon's a crook because Walter Cronkite just said so. So you had the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Boston Globe, you had, you know, you had reputable media outlets and it's not clear that that's true anymore. I mean, there are still, I personally read the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Guardian and I believe most of what I read, but they're still wrong and they do have agendas. So, I mean, I get my information by, by reading like a hundred different things and then I figure it out myself. Yeah. But most of the people I know that are, especially younger people, social media, man, it's like, yeah, that's what, well, actually it's happening today. This is what's happening with the gasoline thing. So the, this is insane. This pipeline thing, it's not even that much gas, number one. They didn't hack the fuel line, number two. They hacked the back office Microsoft system. Number and, and number three is there's no real shortage, but people think there is because a bunch of people went on Facebook two days ago and started saying buy gas now. And I just saw a picture a couple of minutes before we talked. There's guys in, in Atlanta coming up with garbage bags up the yep. gas pumps and they're filling garbage bags. And that's insane. Uh, gosh, totally. I mean, but, but this totally. is all this is all of this though. This is the power of the individual in the digital age. For good for bad and and anything that helps make sense of that it's going to do well yeah yeah totally agree um so so how do you see you know you have you have a just awesome background for everything we want to do how do you see yourself working with the utu team where do you think you'll you'll have the most impact in the direction of the company um i'm the first technical board member That's right so the other board members um, uh, like Levine and people like that have very strong um, financing backgrounds um, or, um, or Lucas or other people who have very strong tech tech crypto backgrounds mm -hmm. in the business sense. Mine is a little bit more hands-on and I think that my role will be working with Bastion and Jason to help formulate strategy based on technology they, you know, feasibility stuff, looking for opportunities. And it's, it's a role I played before. I'm comfortable with it. And you don't have anybody like that in YouTube right now. So I think it's a, that's a good fit for me. It's awesome. Awesome. Yeah. I can't wait to see, uh, you know, how, how you can help. And, uh, yeah, I think it's going to be great just to, to have your technical direction. Um, and, uh, yeah, something that, that, that will certainly help us, um, as we, as we scale and grow. Uh, so that's awesome, David. Thanks for your insight. You know, I think it's clear that we share the same vision of how important trust is, has been, always will be, and you know how uh, what a what a huge impact U2 can have on this. Um, so let's uh, let's move on to the quick fire questions um, to, to to wrap it up. So uh, here's where I'll ask you three questions in succession to learn more about you. Um, so tell us something unique and interesting about you that not many people may know. You've already told us about Steve Jobs and, and uh, everything about your background and crazy stories there, but tell us something that, uh, that that's unique and interesting about you. Um, that's a good question. So I, I'm a, I'm an amateur photographer and I travel a lot in the last eight years. I've been to 75 countries. Wow. Nice. Uh, I climb Mount. It's all adventure travel. I climb Mount Kilimanjaro drove my own dog sled team uh, in Lapland up in the Arctic Circle, uh, rode across Mongolia twice, once with Mongols, once with Kazakhs. Uh, last year before the pandemic, I rode a horse to Everest Base Camp. 
on the Tibetan side. Uh, hiked across the outback in one year. I hiked all seven continents in one year. Wow, that's amazing. It's great. Um, if you can chat with anyone, dead or alive, who would it be and why? Um, Alan Turing. Yeah. So, Alan Turing, for anyone who doesn't know, he's dead. British computer scientist. Uh, he invented many things that we take for granted today. Uh, just one of his most brilliant innovations was uh, the idea of a Turing test uh, on how you can tell when an AI becomes truly intelligent. And, he's, and the Turing test is you sit at a machine, you type, and the thing on the other end types. And after five minutes, you get up and you say, I can't tell, it seems like a human. That's the Turing test. Yeah. Uh, he was also invented, he didn't invent cryptography, but he, he certainly contributed a good bit to it. And he was also a mis misunderstood man. He was gay, nobody knew he was. Mm -hmm. He was hounded out of existence and his life was ruined. And I've always thought his perspective on World War II London cryptography and the future of artificial intelligence would be a fascinating conversation. Awesome. All right, last quick fire question. What is something that you believe but few others agree with? So this is not an Area 51 question, right? Or maybe, or maybe it is. <laughs> um, well, I'll make it about the subject matter. Yeah. I, and this is actually quite controversial. I believe that no government will ever help anybody with privacy or security in a meaningful way. I think the lag time between inventing something and having legislators, first off, understand it, second off, pass bills that deal with it, and third off, wait for the, the court system to catch up and have case law in any country. I think that gap is 10 to 20 years, minimum. Wow. And, and, and uh, I can actually prove this. I'm writing a book about this right now. So uh, as a consequence, if you, if you want to protect yourself in this world as a person, a company, or government, I think you need to do it yourself. I think this is like brushing your teeth. I mean, nobody brushes your teeth for you. I think, I think cybersecurity, I think your identity and your reputation online, I, I, I would not look to the court system to save you on this. I think if, 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 if any of this is important to you, and that includes, it's like Bitcoin wallets. You buy Bitcoin, you put it in a wallet, you can't remember your catchphrase, guess what? It's gone. Something like 15% of all Bitcoin that's ever been minted is in that category that cannot be, re it's like pirate treasure in the Caribbean. You're just never going to get it back again. Yeah. So I think that as we move forward, I think especially millennials and Gen Zs are going to have to grow when they are, grow up digitally world aware, and they're going to have to take their digital life in their own hands. Yeah, I mean, I think you're seeing something similar like that in just in terms of cryptocurrency, where the government will always kind of protect their own interests, right? And and we'll always look on like, okay, what's the bad? What are some of the bad things can happen with this particular technology uh, to the state, to uh, to the to the government, um, and then craft their legislation very slowly around that, right? Uh, so I think that is a is a good point in the sense that uh, they're they're not going to look out for you, and even if they do, it's going to be really really long long time down the road. So awesome, David! I know like we can talk forever. And I hope you know. I, I think we'll we'll definitely get together. I'd love to hear uh, many many of your stories here uh, in DC. But thank you so much for taking part in this uh, Trust Garden interview and telling us your story. Um, we are super excited to have you on our board of directors. Director. So any any parting words for the audience? Be cyber safe. Those, those are, that's some good advice. Thanks, yeah. Mike. Yeah. All right, Trust Guardians, we hope you enjoyed that interview with David. Uh, in the video description below, uh, I'll post a link to the article that announced David's uh, appointment to the board and uh, highlights the backgrounds of David as well as our other board members. Uh, so be sure to check that out. And of course, hit please hit those like, subscribe, and notification buttons so you don't miss any future Trust Guardian interviews. Thanks for, so much for tuning in and uh, we'll see you soon. Have a good one. Thanks, David. Bye.